So these are some of my missed calls. I got DoorDash, that checks out. Rite Aid was desperately trying to get a hold of me to fill a prescription, which they shouldn't have because I got it filled somewhere else. Wait, is this why they're going bankrupt? Is it my fault? Oh no, they're just restructuring in the wake of poor sales and opioid lawsuits. What a relief. Anyway, cellular phones are an indispensable part of our lives. The latest data from Pew Research finds that 97% of Americans own some kind of cell phone. Whether it's an iPhone, a flip phone, or whatever Android device is polluting my group chats with those putrid green bubbles. You know it's easier for the one guy with the Android thing to switch instead of the 10 other people in the thread using iPhones, right? Come at me. Anyway, in the rest of the world, which doesn't care about iMessage or SMS or RCS because they communicate over WeChat or WhatsApp, they like phones too. Our good friends at the World Economic Forum say that as of 2022, there are more cell phones than people on our planet. Human population, 7.95 billion. Mobile phone population, 8.58 billion. Scientists unofficially refer to our modern geologic age as the Anthropocene, defined by the influence on the natural world by humans. An era which some believe either started around the time of the Industrial Revolution or after the development of the atomic bomb. But back in October of 1983, that's when we officially appear to have dialed into what I'm calling the Telefonocene. That's what the news refresh's crack research team at Google Translate claims is phone in Greek plus scene, which means new. Look, I'm not a linguist. And neither is this guy, I don't think. But he is a principal member of the technical staff at AT&T Labs. The team uh, was really formed in the late 60s, early 70s. I came to join Bell Laboratories in 1972 when this was a concept. Uh, never existed, and I had the opportunity as part of that team to do all the technology work that led to the first commercial call in 1983. Yes, that's right. This guy was on the team that developed the first cellular telephones, and here's one of them right now. So this is an, not an actual replica. This would have been an actual phone. I was fortunate enough to, you know, you know, be given this when I left the, when I left the program. But people would actually have this in the car. They would dial the number in, press the send button, pick up the handset, and talk. Notice that he said people had this in their car, which makes sense given the size of the thing. Even your finest J. Crew giant fit chinos couldn't accommodate the sheer girth of this guy. Because here's the thing, as AT&T notes on its blog, the telephones people used to use were essentially appliances that lived in a fixed place, like your refrigerator. Hi, is your refrigerator running? Hello, you've reached your Rite Aid pharmacy located at. Prank calls were way better when everything wasn't automated. Anyway, the very first cell phones were built as devices that were meant to be installed in your car. So even though the phones themselves weren't really mobile, the car was mobile. So it wasn't really a mobile phone, but the car is mobile. You see what I'm saying? What people would do in their cars is they would actually enter and dial in the number press the send button, and then pick up the phone and talk like people would on a conventional telephone. Now before this thing came about, there had been radio powered communications in cars, but these new cellular powered car phones, which were made possible by a new type of communications technology, kind of appear to be a niche gadget. It's sort of like that Apple Vision Pro thing. It seemed impressive, but people didn't quite know what to do with it. No one really understood the impact of that moment. In fact, my very first job uh, at Bell Labs when I joined in 1972, was to support a market survey to understand if there was a market demand for commercial cellular service. And professional survey done, it, when it was completed, the conclusion was there was no market for such a service. A similar survey was done about 10 years later, and the same conclusion came back. So no one could really anticipate the proliferation that's taking place today. Yeah, it turns out people like being able to get a hold of loved ones and send Snapchats from the toilet. And the origin of these things being placed in our hands dates back 40 years this month. October 13th, 1983 to be precise. 40 years ago was the first commercial cellular call. It was an event sparked in Soldier Field in Chicago because Chicago was the base of the original commercial service. But the work that went into creating Chicago actually dates back to the 1940s that led to the evolution that became the first commercial cellular call in Chicago. So according to the Chicago Tribune, an AT&T subsidiary set up an experimental cell phone network across 2,500 miles of Chicagoland in June of 1983. And among the first people to sign up for this new cellular service was an insurance salesman who had just gotten robbed. My prior phone, I had a car with a, with a radio phone 
I used it for business extensively. It worked very well, was very expensive to use. I had had my car stolen and when that, uh, when they replaced the equipment in my new car, they asked if I wanted to go to a cellular service, I'd have to wait three months for the system be, to be turned on. That was in July of 83. So after that happened, um, I, I agreed. I said, if that's the system that's going to be taking over, yes, let's get the self-service. Somewhere between then and October, they contacted me to see if I'd like to join the party for the announcement uh, and the first uh, phone call. This insurance salesman is greatly underselling this party. It was a publicity stunt called the Great Cellular Race, and it took place at Soldier Field in Chicago. 14 early adopters of these cellular car phones took part in a race during which technicians ran across a parking lot to install a chip in the car's trunk, after which the owner of the car got inside the vehicle to see if they would be the one to place the very first call to the communication company's president sitting in another car. The Cubs announcer, Jack Brickhouse, even narrated the play-by-play. -play. This insurance salesman turns out to have been in the winning vehicle and told the Tribune that the first ever commercial cell phone call was just a simple, hello, congratulations. Now, if that seems anticlimactic, I don't even answer my cell phone when it rings these days. It's usually just some pushy pharmacy trying to heal my body. But during the great cellular race, our insurance guy here also placed the very first international cell phone call to a very noteworthy recipient, I think. The phone call was made to Germany to Alexander Graham Bell's grand, I believe it was her, her, her granddaughter, not, not a young person, an elderly person who did not speak English. And so it was a little interesting, uh, I just, uh, my understanding is because of that, the phone call had to be shortened. Also, let me clear something up about this story. These 40-year-old phone calls were the first commercial cell phone calls ever made, as in the first ones made available to people like you and me to place. Well, not me, because I wouldn't be born for several years, but you know what I'm saying. But mobile phone tech dates back to the 1940s, and this guy, Martin Cooper, is the one credited with inventing the cell phone itself, and during its development made the first public cell phone call from a New York City street on April 3rd, 1973, 10 years before this great cellular race. Anyway, after the race, the guy got an oversized check for $2,809 for winning the race. It was supposed to cover the cost of the phone, though he says the phone actually cost $3,600. That's more than 11 grand in today's money. And interestingly, the Apple Vision Pro is supposed to start around $3,500, which would have only been $1,164 back in 1983. Does that make looking this cool seem more affordable?